Hi guys, so I spoke to Kevin Maher, author of A United Ireland, Why Unification is Inevitable and How It Will Come About. We spoke about how close we are to seeing such a thing, what needs to take place, the time frame and what it will look like, but also how the British government and unionism will react to it. Hope you enjoy. So Kevin, can I ask you, how close are we actually to a United Ireland? Um, it's a bit hard to put a de to put a pin in the in the calendar and say it's definitely going to be then. I think what what we've got are a range of factors that take us towards the ingredients, if you like, the me the mechanics of of of, of taking us to um, Irish unity, and then of course Irish unity itself. And I think what's what's apparent is that those building blocks are are, are just there in front of us. Um, at one time, Irish unity would have been you know, broadly a, a kind of aspirational, um, perhaps an emotional um, desire on behalf of nationalists and republicans and, you know, given the state of Northern Ireland, who can blame them? Um, and obviously the people in the South as well, but but it would, have, it would have had no agency. It would have been detached from any kind of journey or plan or any kind of reasoned um, explanation. And I think I think for me, what's changed is is all of that has changed. Um, we might not have a quite quite have a date. I can't I can't imagine that we're not going to get to a border poll in the probably in the next five to ten years. So, sorry, that, sorry, think, sorry to interrupt you. Can, can you explain yeah. a little bit about what a border poll is and how it works? Sure. So the Good Friday Agreement has a, a guarantee that if it looks likely at any time that um, a majority of people in Northern Ireland would wish to test the constitutional position, i.e. would you like to leave the UK and become part of the United Ireland or would you like to stay in the UK? then that, that canon should be tested in a border poll, a, a, a constitutional referendum. And, and that takes place in Northern Ireland and also in parallel in the South as well. Um, because of course, the notion of consent is, is means that you know, there's no change unless the majority wanted. And of course that applies just as equally to the South as it does to the North. I mean, in the South, it's a lot easier, I think, to divine these issues. I mean, poll, poll after poll shows two thirds of people um, respond very positively to the notion of Irish unity obviously it's not as not as stark as that in in the north because you've got um obviously a unionist block that it wouldn't be a unionist block if it if it, if it wanted a united Ireland by definition um but I think we could we can start to see that um that pathway in front of us um the, the kind of factors that, that are going to propel us to that point are, are already there and I think I think they're I think just very broadly, and in a sense, it's, it's probably the core of my argument in my book, is, is that um, you know, Southern Ireland has changed fundamentally, um, not only in terms of in terms of its you know kind of social liberalism and, and, and things like that, but but actually in terms of its economic dynamism. And for me, that's an absolutely fundamental point. You know, a hundred years ago, um, what you had, and part of the reason for partition, of course, is that you've got a industrialized, successful, dynamic northern economy. That didn't want to kind of be lumbered, if you like, with with a kind of more sclerotic agricultural southern economy. Um, now that's completely changed, and and you know Northern Ireland has, has struggled and suffered deindustrialization, like many areas have, and and in that sense, it does have something something quite in common with with perhaps with Northern England. Um, but the South, of course, has been on a transformational journey, um, really from the sixties onwards. It's it's obviously gone out there into the world. Um, been open for business, pulled in lots of investment. It's brilliant at doing that, even to, even today. Um, but it, its economy is is you know is is a knowledge economy. It's founded on you know on 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 um, you know the skills and aptitudes of its people. Um, it's involved in all the right sectors. It pulls in lots of you know lots of lots of global companies. Brings in lots and lots. It perhaps doesn't pay taxes, but it <laughs> brings in lots and lots of important jobs for, for, for you know for for a kind of knowledge economy. And as as a, as a result, you see um, you know the Republic of Ireland ranked um, second in the world in term in terms of uh, quality of life. And there's lots of these indicators where, where you know the Ireland kind of um, you know kind of comes out on top. So there's been this huge turnaround. The North is, is, as I say, reliant on, on a ten billion pound um, bung every year from from the from the uh, Majesty's Treasury, and to keep the place going, its private sector is 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 underdeveloped. Its public sector, by definition, is overdeveloped. We're probably happy these days that that means um, civil servants and local government officers are not kind of soldiers and spooks. Um, it's a different kind of public sector these days, at least. Th th you know, thank God for that. But it it will benefit enormously from being part of this much more dynamic policy framework that they've got in the south. And, and you know studies have shown that 
the North would benefit on a kind of two to one basis. Um, um, on, you know, it, you know, it would, it would see a rapid increase in in um, um, you know quality of life, in income, in opportunity. So, so, so I think that's a very important factor that turnaround with Ireland. I think then you've got lots of other factors in play, not least of which the kind of centrifugal forces in the British state. So, so there's a lot going on on the other side of the Irish Sea. Um, there's a lot going on in terms of um, Scotland teeing up um, a second tilt at independence. Um, that's likely, um, it's likely for, for no other reason than, than, than um, campaigners have been re-energised by Brexit. Of course, the first referendum, 2014, no one's heard of Brexit. That wasn't a thing. And they ran this very, very close, 55 to 45. And, you know, it was, it was, it was, it's one of those issues that I think people in Westminster have kind of tended to forget and ignore. And it's a, and it's a fundamental key political event of the last decade, really, that result. Um, that result, in terms of those numbers, haven't really dropped back or changed very much in, in the intervening seven or eight years. Um, you know, there's not there's not been a kind of, all right, we, we, we saw off that surge of support for independence, things have gone back to normal. They haven't. They've stayed pretty much where they were. And you get some polls that tilt the other way and there's a majority and support independence. So that is kind of primed and ready, I think, to, 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 to go again as an issue. And I think that's very important. If Scotland was, was to leave the UK, you know, Northern Ireland's place within it would seem, I think, very kind of anomalous, um, not only given the kind of kith and kin argument with 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 unionists and and and, and people in Scotland, it would seem, as, I think, a bit bizarre that we've got we've lost Scotland, but we've still got this place on the other side of the Irish Sea. It would seem, I think, very asymmetric. But it's not just that. I think I think it's also the views of the British people. And when you say British people, you really mean the English people. Um, you know, there's, there's a there's a fundamental disinterest when it's measured in terms of keeping Northern Ireland. The Brits are really not that bothered, um, and we've got oh, lots of other yes. issues going on anyway. We're leveling up, and 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 you know when, when you when I, mean, I said to somebody the other day um, talking about regeneration and and the need for investment in the north of England, and I pointed out that the kind of funding settlement that Northern Ireland gets, you know, it's a quarter more spent through the Barnet formula um, on Northern Ireland than, than on England, and of course this kind of ten billion subvention, and and uh, you know, a friend sort of say that it's not really particularly interested in these issues is to say wow what could we do with that in the northwest of england the northwest of england has got a population you know three and a half times the size of northern ireland um yeah it doesn't get a doesn't get a, a, a sort of you know a tenth of that kind of that kind of support so, so so i think i think there's some interesting arguments there as well i think we can also look at some of the arguments internal to uh, to northern ireland and, and and you know the numbers really and and by that i mean the census which we're likely to see um a little bit later this year, again, may, may tilt sig symbolically more than anything else. It may tilt um, towards uh, people from a Catholic nationalist heritage outweighing those from a Protestant unionist heritage. You know, it, it, it's been trailed for a very long time, this demographic argument. And, you know, you, you can kind of dismiss it at one regard, saying, well, actually, look, not, not everybody in those categories votes um, for United Ireland or for the union based on, on their religion broadly we know they do um so that, that's significant i think and i think that's been flagged up as a marker of what might justify a border poll down the line as well so, so it's significant who, who, in that respect yeah. who, who is responsible for tr for the the triggering of the the border poll that would be the uk government that would be the northern ireland uh, the secretary it is. for northern ireland right so it, it depends on on him him at the moment or her in the future if if it's if it's uh, if it's a if it's a woman uh they will be they will decide it but at the moment we don't hear a lot from um brandon lewis about s the support for a for a border poll so yeah. w when could we expect um something like that to, to or that position to change i think i mean it's, it's quite quite strange that i think the the expectation of irish unity at the time of the, of the, the signing of the good friday agreement would have been pretty slim it was one of those issues that People have parked and the kind of will get there perhaps eventually tray and 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 there was no again the, the pathway towards getting there w wouldn't have been clear at all I, I, I think it was quite taboo at, at the time oh yeah yeah, yeah absolutely especially in the british media yeah I, 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 absolutely and, and and the fact that of course this is what's brought particularly i think republicans to the table that they can they can pursue their political objectives through exclusively democratic means and and we take the gun out of irish politics and all of that but that guarantee that it's legitimate to have this border poll it's legitimate to have irish unity and and, and the whole tenor and the, the promise of the good friday agreement is that the british and irish governments as co-guarantors 
um, would facilitate a change in the constitutional settlement if that was if that was the, the view of the people in Northern Ireland and again sort of sanctioned and proved by the people in, in, the, in the south so, so so that's kind of where it's left it put Northern Ireland in an, in an antechamber effectively a constitutional antechamber the door closes behind it and the only other door that opens out opens out onto onto Irish unity so Northern Ireland in the in this kind of betwixt and between place constitutionally where there is a promise of it changing radically and fundamentally but there is no attempt to kind of integrate uh, Northern Ireland any more into the UK and I think for me that's a pretty obvious um, point sitting on this side of the Irish scene it's, it's a point I think that's often lost on unionist politicians who I just don't think get Westminster and and you know it was brought home even just this week where where, where you know there, there's a debate in the chamber and, and uh, Ian Paisley made the point where, where's the Prime Minister where's the Secretary of State on, legis on legislation you know referring to Northern Ireland there's no sign of them they're not bothered there's no other Labour MPs hardly there there's no Tory MPs hardly there they don't care it's a faraway place of which they know and care little and I, and I think I think you know I don't mean that as a trite point and I don't mean that to be a provocative point it's just for me just just a you know a statement of the obvious uh, and, I, I, and I think we need to know that British indifference wraps around all these other issues the changing demographics the changing electoral results which are which is which are really significant you know the composition of the assembly which is much much closer than than, than, than is often understood um you know the, the kind of disintegrative um powers that, that that are let loose at the moment in the british state all of these plus you know, obviously we throw in brexit we have to mention the b word um <laughs> they're, they're a very potent cocktail that um that that are helping to push us along the, the road towards Irish unity and, and that border pole and I think that's that's what's different from 20 years ago where when all these factors weren't there they weren't as acute they weren't as obvious they're now very obvious they're, they're right in front of us um, and we, we may see you know even in just a few weeks time in the assembly election results um, you know I, you know if, if the unionist vote splinters three ways and Sinn Féin pretty much stays where it is then you know Sinn Féin's top of the pops and then we get another crisis because the unionists won't, won't nominate a Sinn Féin first minister and we get another crisis and, and you know and, and kind of on, on it goes and I, th I think if I, I think a lot of people will reflect on you know the, the fundamental the fundamental point is Northern Ireland was not built to last it was not built well um, it was built as a Protestant unionist fief it was run as one for five years that led us to the troubles and then after the troubles we've had this 20 years of stop start uh, political progress and, and an attempt at political normality and you know, nobody looks on it and says, "Oh, this looks really well." Um, the assembly and the executive have only met for half of the half of the intervening period because of one crisis after another. Yet, you know, at an instant, this is the very best that Northern Ireland has ever been governed. You know, it, you know, it, it's you know, the, the, the discrimination, the way that the unionists ran this place for five decades was an international disgrace. You know, and, it, and it, it led to the troubles. You know, the brutalization of the civil rights movement, the lack of kind of interest in reform and making this place habitable for catholic nationalists um you know let, let us let us down into that very dark place and and you know you can look at it and say look this place doesn't work well it's very dysfunctional but this is the best it's ever been governed and my point is this is the best northern ireland will ever be governed it's never going to get any better than this so so i think i think you know you start to draw a conclusion northern ireland as a project is 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 kind of intellectually finished um, it doesn't really have any legs to go. We've got a pathway that takes us to a new place, you know, a new island, a constitutional referendum on, 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 on creating that. And I think I think increasingly all the energy, particularly from the non-unionist side of, of, of Irish politics, is going to be focused on that border problem, getting us towards it. And I think we may see, you know, even in the next few months with census and election results, again, the, the kind of logic of that being pretty much overwhelming. According to the, the Good Friday Agreement, it's important that the British government remain impartial in any border poll. Do, do you see them doing that? Do you see them respecting that? Um, or is it... Um, because I, I'm a little bit concerned when... Well, when I look at the Labour Party, when their response to it was, yes, we will be impartial if we're in government. While on the Conservative side, it's a bit more iffy. What, what, what's your take on that? I think I think I think officially uh, I think the British government will will remain absolutely neutral. I mean, the political parties can can 
you know, can get involved. And I suspect there'll be there will be people in the Labour Party um, very strongly supportive of um, Irish unity. There will be people in the Conservative Party very strongly aligned with with the Unionists, and will will help and augment their campaigns. But I don't see um, I don't see that being um, you know jumping in feet first. I think the British government will be very very careful about its positioning. Um, not least, of course, because it's you know it's, it's an international treaty obligation. This is not just a you know kind of political um, decision. <laughs> I, I, absolutely, and, and and I think very broadly, I think there'll be un, under their breath, there'll be there'll be you know they'll be hoping that there is a constitutional change and that this troublesome enclave is taken out of their <laughs> out of their hands. And I suspect that will be the view in Whitehall. Um, but I think I think you'll see people from different political parties kind of get involved a little bit. I mean, it's a little bit similar to um, the ninety eight referendum on the Good Friday Agreement, where. I, I went across with lots of other people from the, from the Labour Party, and then, you know, of course, everybody was kind of fighting on the same side, really, in, 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 on that um, on that result, which was probably a first and probably a last as well. Um, but I think it really will be led to the parties and the politicians um, in the north to, to to push this and campaign for this. But I think there'll be an enormous international. Um, interest as well. Yeah, um, definitely from the United States and. and oh God, I, I mean, I think this is going to be a once in a century kind kind of moment, um, and I think everybody will be very clear about the stakes being, you know, very high and 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 sort of history um, really kind of potentially going off in a slightly different direction. It's a real inflection point, uh, so I think there'll be no shortage of interest. Um, now, now unionists might say, well, well, actually, good because um, we struggle with the you know the garden centre unionists who. Kind of take things for granted don't get involved don't vote um and and when it comes to the constitutional question they will all come out now i mean i've heard the arguments about the kind of the phantom army of voters um in every in all kinds of contexts over the last 30 years and and it never, majority, it never really comes to pass i have to say um but but i think there'll be you know there'll be huge interest and, and and you know a huge turnout and if there is then it becomes a pretty conclusive result i think at that point um and, okay. and, and i think we, we need to you know we need to guard against um nobody wants this to be um 50 percent plus one yes. um you know the, the you know, i think most people would want that to be a pretty conclusive result i think the reality is it won't be a pretty conclusive result it will be you know it, it may mirror the kind of scottish result 55 to 45 at that point given brexit was it was delivered on 52 to 48 uh, and that held i mean there's a very powerful legal precedent at that point to to, to observe any simple majority um, and I, I think the idea of, of kind of weighting this to kind of apply a kind of super majority, you know, got, there's got to be 70%, there's got to be a majority of unionists happy with it, you know, but we'll never get anywhere at that point. This will just trundle on and trundle on and trundle on forever and we'll get periodic political crises and we, we have always run the risk of things tipping off off, off the straight and narrow again. So, so I, I think there's got to be there's got to be a recognition um, that, you know, that when this ballot comes, that whatever the result is, people honour people the result. I'd like to move on, move on uh, away from the border Poland and to an, the, an actual United Ireland. What, what would that actually look like in real terms? What, what, what changes do you expect to take place if, uh, if the border poll is successful for a vote for uh, reunification? I mean, I think one of the easiest aspects of all this um, is very hard to very hard to, to grapple with the cultural issues and the heritage issues and the identity issues you know you can't do much about any of that people will think what they will think um <clears throat> but i think they if, if, you, if you had a free hand to say we need to integrate um northern ireland and the southern irish state and, and you know potentially create something new as well um that for me is, is probably the easiest part of all this because we're not talking about um huge populations we're not talking about um, jurisdictions that are, that are you know massively different we're talking about jurisdictions that have got high levels of infrastructure high levels of public spend um you know there's a lot of interconnectivity to begin with i think what we're looking at is, is things like um you know there's the policy framework around the economy applying to the north and and you know the kind of you know the kind of transfer of of of, of that and the incorporation of that i think will be you know, have a profound effect very, very quickly. We're talking would, about would you, know, you would you support would would you support uh, the idea of maintaining the Northern Ireland Assembly? Do you think that would work? Personally, I I I, I would be against that. I think it would just yeah. create um it create two states within the one state, and, and there's I, no I real agree benefit. very very much with that. Um, I mean, my my view is what you would end up with is a zombie parliament. It sat there at Stormont. Um, creating mischief effectively. I mean, it, it, there's no, there's no point to it. Now, now, some people say, look, it's symbolic. 
some people say, well, 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 actually, you know, you know, it could, it could be a sort of home of a second chamber in a New Island settlement. You know, you, you, you end up a little bit like like Brussels does with with the European Parliament meeting in Strasbourg and, and, and Brussels, which, you know, is just pretty ludicrous. I think I think, to be honest, you, you've got to bite the bullet and say, um, you know, the whole of the island of Ireland, you know, United Ireland is still, you know, a population of fewer than seven million people. The idea that it needs it needs another regional centre an hour and a half up the road from Dublin. Um, you know, is, is absolutely bonkers. If you, if you if you wanted to devolve power in, in in a big meaningful way, you you'd probably put something in Cork or, or Galway. Um, you know, that that would that would at least be rational. So I think <coughs> I think we need to be rational about this and, and not sort of say, look, actually, um, you know, kind of almost have prizes. This will this will help unionists acclimatise. I don't think it will. I think I think unionists are pretty practical people, and would see it for the sop that it is. Now, I, th I think what is much more interesting is to take a look at the way Ireland is governed. And I think it's very timely, given given you know the, the kind of galloping economic growth that, that we've seen in Ireland, that its its political institutions are not really fit for purpose. And I think I think it could incorporate a lot of the the drivers from effectively what's happening in Britain um, in, ter in terms of devolution, powerful executive mayors and 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 assemblies, um, and recognizing that actually you can't just run a modern economy off one engine. You know, we're, we're, in Britain, we're finding this with London and the South East. You know, even 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 the conservatives in Michael Gove are coming forward with some very interesting ideas um, a couple of weeks ago about leveling up and trying to make sure that we address the productivity gap between the north and the Midlands and, and the south, and, and that we you know we create three engines of growth rather than one. Ireland's got the same challenge. Um, you know, Dublin is overheating. People are moving out because they can't afford to live there. It's just pretty crackers. Although if you can live there, it's a great place to live. Um, but we need to make sure that Galway and Cork and Waterford and, and everywhere in between are also great places to live and economically, you know, valuable as well. And the same, the same with same with Belfast and of course and Derry, which you know in, under the settlement is again cut off from pretty much everywhere. So, so, so I, th I think there's a need to say. Um, let's look at infrastructure. Let's look at connectivity across across the island of Ireland. But let's look at political institutions and structures. Let's not get caught up with Stormont. It's as you know, it, it would be a zombie parliament that, that wouldn't have enough business to do. Um, it would have effectively have nothing to do apart from just carry on this kind of constant identity politics row, you know, for, for for another hundred years. Let's get rid of that. But let's create meaningful devolved political power. Um, across Northern Ireland and across the whole of the island of Ireland, let's have let's have powerful executive mayors. Let's have a counterbalance between between them and and London. And I think I think I think you would you would very quickly create um, in the north um, viable, uh, powerful political roles that unionists in in various areas would win and and would get. Not not least of of course in in in, you know, in the door that you know you would have a very potentially a very big voting block of people from a unionist heritage as well, which which probably would very quickly end up in government there as well. So so, so, so there's a lot would on you, the table would, for unionists without without sort of giving them the sop of Stormont. I think. Like for example, for the unionists, the unionist politicians I'm thinking of, would they be absorbed into the the parties that uh, currently exist in the republic, or do you see? the DUP or the UUP existing as a party? Because for me, it's, it's very strange, the, uh, the concept. Uh, and I don't mean this in any offensive way, but it's almost like looking back at the, the Confederacy in the United States, where there's, you know, the Confederacy is no more. And there are people who would like to hark back to something like that. Um, would you see that happening in, in the United Ireland, where the, the, the unionist politicians, and not talking about unionists themselves, but just unionist politicians, would they try to continue the DUP or the UUP as political entities, or would they be, in a sense, absorbed by into parties in the Republic, or would we see new parties forming? I think I think it'll be a mixture of the latter two. I think there'll be I think there'll be some absorption. I think there'll be some commonality. Um, but I, but I think I think what would happen is the, the mold will start to break. It's all it's already kind of breaking a little bit. I think down south anyway. You know, with the, with, the, with the Sinn Féin surge, which, which you know, you look at you know every poll since February 2020, since they actually you know did break through um, with the actual numbers in actual votes in an actual election. Um, the, you know, the numbers ever since suggest um, that that support is deep and consistent and, and very granular and and, and surprisingly um, deep. You know, with with kind of abc1 voters so the kind of you know the middle class professionals which which you know which which is probably quite surprising um given their antecedents um so so i think i think that there's kind of 
there's a push for reform at the grown level anyway. I mean, again, part of this reflects um, Ireland's demography, obviously with, with a lot of young people as well. Um, and I think what would happen in, in the North is that, you know, the political parties there, you know, are often pretty much creatures of the, the start of the Troubles. So, the, you know, the DUP alliance and the SDLP are formed pretty much at the same time, 1970, 1971. You know, they're, they're kind of, you know, one man and his dog outfits in terms in terms of party structure and, and and membership and things like that. They've not necessarily got very deep roots. So I think I think you could you could start to see new perhaps new configurations. And I think what will start to happen in the south, interestingly, when you look at the, the polls every 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 couple of weeks, you know, the numbers of the, the numbers for for kind of centre left parties, so Sinn Fein, big block there, but then some of the smaller parties as well. You start to add that together, you get a pretty significant centre left vote. Um, you know, in Irish politics. And I think the thing that's obviously been the thing that's been missing for a hundred years down south, Fine Gael, Fine Foyle, Civil War parties, Fine Foyle, brilliant at Cutspur, they're, you know, much more like a kind of Peronist South American kind of political party where, where it's, you know, hell fellow well met and good old boys and, you know, the, you know, all the fun in the Galway tent kind of thing. And, and, and you know, the left wing when they need to be left wing, but the right wing when they need to be right wing, and all the rest of it. And they've been brilliant at doing that. I don't think that will hold. I think I think I think Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are going out of business, or, or, or they're going to have to massively, I think, reconfigure. Um, and and I think then you start to see, you know, the, the kind of northern dimension feed into that. And I, th I think what it will do is, is flush out some of this kind of, you know, stale um, kind of politics from a particular period it will flush it out and, and create a new politics and I, th I think it will probably reflect a more normal um you know kind of center left center right centrist um kind of system i think th i think that's what's coming um and i think that, that that's broadly positive i mean the challenge then for you know for, for, for lots of people from the unionist heritage who are represented by right-wing parties you know the dup i mean not to be disparaging it's just a very right-wing party the also unionists are a very right-wing party the tuv are a very 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 right-wing party um the pup again they've tried to kind of create a kind of you know kind of local level kind of working class loyalist thing it's, it's never got anywhere i mean it's just a disaster it's always been a disaster uh, you know I'm, I'm sorry it is a disaster it, it would be nice if there was some kind of cognizance from working class loyalists that they are you know they are working class and they've got more in common with a Catholics up the road in terms of housing and jobs than they've got with, you know, Ian Paisley on his holidays in Sri Lanka. Uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, they keep voting for Ian Paisley on his holidays in Sri Lanka. So, so you know, you can lead a horse to water. But I, th I think I th that what would be interesting in that in that constellation is that they're probably not going to join Sinn Féin, I, I would suspect. But there may be other centre-left parties or groupings that are created that you get working class loyalists feeding into. And I think that would be really interesting and, and, and really timely. So, so I, th I think that, you know, the, the, the kaleidoscope, all the pieces will, 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 will eventually settle, but I think it will settle on a more familiar centre-left, centre-right um, kind of system than, than we've got at the moment, which is, you know, kind of Benetton, kind of 57 different varieties of, of, of political party. Um. I'd like to move on to on to the book. Tell, tell me a little bit about the book. What was your inspiration for writing it? Um, and, uh, and can you tell us a, a little bit about the background of it? Yeah, no. It's, it's, so, I mean, I, I wrote the first edition in, in 2016 and um, I, I was writing it and I've just about finished it before kind of Brexit happened. And a bit like the, the you know, the, the Donald Trump victory of several times in the last few years where I've, I've gone to bed thinking, I, you know, common sense tells me what the result's <laughs> going to be. And then you wake up the next day and, of course, it's the complete opposite of what you... And, and, and that was a view, of I think, of everybody. And I, th I think that the, the Brexit shot waves, of, of, of the bow waves of it, are still are still working their way out. And, and you know, the view for, for the first several years is, is just that, how the hell did this happen? And, and we've got to reverse it because this is terrible. And I think there's now been that kind of settled, this is happening, we've got to kind of work it through and, 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 all, and all the rest of it. But nobody, nobody believed it was going to happen. I mean, nobody in Westminster believed that. David Cameron didn't believe it. George Osborne, they were running the campaign. Even, the even Farage didn't... I, yeah, Farage, I'm sure, I'm sure Farage wanted it, but, but I suspect he thought, look, I, I, you know, I can't reach the whole electorate. I can, I can galvanise a fifth of the electorate who, who love me. And then, unfortunately, the remaining 80% all hate me. Um, and, and that's, you know, so he couldn't push it. But, but, but it, it crossed the line. It crossed the line for a number of factors. The impacts of, of, of free movement and mass migration into Britain, which has never been reconciled as a, as a you know, the, the public have never been reconciled to that. And I think that played a huge part um, in, in driving Brexit. Um, so, but anyway, we get Brexit. So, so I, I basically written a book um, 
saying, you know, United Ireland is inevitable before Brexit. Um, so, of course, you're trying to analyse Brexit in real time <clears throat> for what it means, which is obviously impossible because you can work out long term what it's likely to mean, but you don't know because we're, we're not at that point. So I thought it's also I've got to come back to it at some stage, which is what I did um, last year. And again, we're still working Brexit out and there's still things in six months time which are not apparent today. Um, but it struck me that the core argument that that you know demography is changing, election results um, significantly are, are you know are, are kind of kind of getting much much narrower. Um, the principle of consent in the Good Friday Agreement that allows and facilitates this this vote. Um, you know the kind of structural issues in the South, um, the structural issues in Britain with with Scottish independence as, as a likely prospect. You know these factors alone were were you know are just massive and, and are taking us towards as I say. That, that, that border port. Then when you throw Brexit in as well and, and kind of it affects, you know, Northern Ireland fundamentally and the relationship between Northern Ireland and the British state fundamentally, there, then, you know, I, th I think, you, you know, the, the, these factors have, have got um, even more acute um, between writing the first edition and writing the second edition. Um, so, so I think I think a lot of the things I talked about in the first edition are still, are still true, still broadly true. That's still was constellation of issues. Um, but of course, Brexit is, is 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 much more acute. It's going to lead to um, you know, it's lead, lead, lead to the, the protocol, which is regardless of what unionists say or do, is going to stay. Um, can, can, I just, lead... can I just pick your brain yeah. on that? Do, do you actually see the protocol as somewhat slowing the process towards a United Ireland? Because the way I look <clears> at it, <throat> it's almost something that the, that the union should be promoting more because it creates Absolutely. a unique situation for you not, um, Northern Ireland to be able to access the British internal market and the single market and in a United Ireland they wouldn't actually have that benefit. I, I, absolutely I mean you could end, you could see a scenario with the protocol um, if unionists ever acclimatise themselves to it where, where you know you get British headquartered companies moving to Belfast to be able to access the single market you know that they you know it, it, it creates a fillip for, for, for investment um, investment from Britain particularly as well into 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 to Belfast um, to access the single market. Um, <clears throat> it's an, you know it's a it's a very powerful opportunity, but that that's been lost. I think the where the DUP were twelve months ago, and there's bits of footage on the on the internet of Arlene Foster and and, and uh, Jeffrey Donaldson sort of making the kind of best of both worlds argument, which they're right they're, that they were right then. They're wrong now, but they were right then, and it, it does offer the best of both worlds. And the challenge for United Islanders, <clears throat> excuse me, is if we're kind of writing Northern Ireland off as a you know, as an economic kind of backwater. Um, what if it wasn't an economic backwater? What if it was a pretty dynamic, um, up and coming kind of region? Um, would that make more people kind of satisfied with the status quo? Um, arguably, it would. Um, and that's a, that's a challenge to, to reflect on. It's not that I, you know, I don't want the the, the, the the protocol. I think the protocol is a good thing. Stops the stops any any, any kind of hard border. But if Northern Ireland becomes more economically successful, then I think it does so in the context of being more integrated into the Southern Irish economy and into Europe by, by, extension, by extension. So I, th I think it's a kind of both sides of this debate, the United Islanders and the status quoers, if I can put it like that, um, both um, can see arguments for and against um, you know, the, the effects of the protocol. For me, the protocol would be a good thing. Growth and jobs and investment in Northern Ireland would be a good thing because it would make that integration, it would make um, you know, creating that United Ireland a lot easier. Um, I don't think it will have a massive effect on the non-unionist side of the equation. I think I think a lot of people there will say, actually, if we're benefiting from this arrangement, we would benefit even more if we had if we if we were connected into the South properly in the United Ireland. So, so I, I, for me, that that's my takeaway from it. Perfect, um, Kevin. Where, where can we where can we find your book? Um, as I say, it's in all good bookshops. Um, <clears throat> it's online as well. Um, it's published by Bite Back. Uh, it's on their website. You can get it from there, or it's on Amazon, I think, as well. And what? Just before I let you go, a prediction for uh, both when we can see a border poll and the possible result of that. I think we'll we'll see one within the ne within the next decade. I think it will be. I think we'll probably end up with a very interesting result in the assembly in May, which and the optics of that will look as though actually opinion has shifted and moved and, and all the rest of it. Um, and then I think if we end up with a kind of a political crisis off the back of it, which I think you can price in, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think that's, that's one, one constant of the last hundred years, it's political crises in Northern Ireland. 
that that I think I think for people from a nationalist and Republican background, you know, their, their view is let's just get to a border poll. That that's you know that that's what we want now. That's sort of that's a rational response. It's an evidence based response. And I think that will that will start to dominate their political discourse. And I, th I think the British government, you know, in the, in the next parliament, so so from twenty twenty five onwards, this is going to bubble up to the top of the prime minister's in tray in a very big way. Uh, and I think I think they they, they may then um, look at the what's happening in the north is 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 a kind of evidence of demand. I think I think that's the, that's the kind of premise of the Good Friday Agreement. By that stage, in, by 2025, we'll have had a general election in the South as well. And if Sinn Féin are in government, either as a majority or, or minority partner, you know, this is going to be top of their agenda as well. And I think at that point, a British government may just say um, the choreography is there to do something here. And all we're, all we're obliged to do is to fulfil our obligations under the Good Friday Agreement. We're not cutting off Northern Ireland and letting, you know, letting these people go we're we're facilitating a referendum and the public will make their decision and if the majority say come back and say we want to be part of the uk then united Ireland is going to have to sit that up uh, on the on the on quid pro quo if there is a majority for change then that has to be facilitated so i think the the, the choice that a british prime minister has after 2025 actually gets easier if if ireland is seen to do the heavy lifting um you know in the north and in the south very good. Thanks so much for talking to me today, Kevin. Delighted.